Beautiful people, uh, welcome to our Q&A session. As some of you, in fact 41,275 <laughs> of you may know, we crossed the Atlantic, we sailed across the Atlantic from Bermuda to Portugal and because this is something we get so many questions about, we thought we would do a dedicated question and answer session. We have asked you for questions on YouTube and Facebook and probably even Instagram. So thank you so much for all the questions, it's been really, really useful for us to kind of like find out what you want to hear. Here? Yes. And these are the answers. Question one. Question one is from Martin who sent us a Facebook message. Thank you Martin. And um, he had a few questions but the two that I wanted to answer in this particular um, session was uh, what is the general feeling you get before a crossing? Is it excitement, fear or stress? And I'll just uh, I'll, I'll also say the second part of this question, which is, what scares you the most, and have you ever been truly afraid at sea? Without wishing to kind of turn this into a much longer question, it should be. <laughs> We've done two crossings. Mm -hmm. The first crossing, it was fear. Like, literally, up until we left, I was petrified. And I you're talking about the 2015 Atlantic yeah, yeah, crossing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I was more scared than I have ever been about anything in my life because it was my first crossing. Yeah. And, you know, we had to get a boat, which had done... We'd done a 500-mile passage to get to uh, across the Bay of Biscay. So we had done offshore sailing, but it's the kind of great unknown. So the first time I was, I was beyond, I think that's the most scared I've ever been in my life. And I said, I was quite candid about this when we did a, a Q and A before, that I almost, I kind of, I've never had one before, but I came very close to having a couple of panic attacks um, mid Atlantic because I kind of, would, I remember getting on, coming on to watch at about two in the morning uh, in the 2015 uh, crossing and just thinking, what the bloody hell are you doing? Like, you've got your partner, you've got your friends in a 12-metre plastic boat 1,500 miles from land. Like, are you crazy? Like, And I really had to kind of, like, swallow it down and go, just man up, man up, boy. You, you, it's not what you can do about it. So the first, that was the first crossing. Second crossing, didn't think about it at all. Mm. It literally was just get on with it. Um, so, yeah... The second time it was really kind of like, without kind of wishing to think, you know, to kind of belittle what it was, I didn't worry at all about it because I knew that we we were all proven. Um, the boat, more importantly, the boat has proven to be amazing. Yeah. And that we knew the crew could do it. Yeah, I do. I, I agree. I think that um, our sets of emotions, or my set, Nick's already explained his, but my set of emotions uh, before our first Atlantic crossing, which was from the Canaries to St. Lucia, and I'll link to our blog post about that. In one of these corners i don't know which corner it's going to be one of the corners i'll link to the our blog post about that um we were all pretty stressed i was stressed nick was stressed our crew i don't think they were too stressed but everyone around us was was excited and uh apprehensive about this long probably three week crossing at sea and because mainly because we didn't know what it was going to be like and we thought the weather would be okay but we didn't know how the boat would handle three weeks of downwind sailing we didn't know whether it would be comfortable we didn't know whether we'd be able to sleep we didn't know whether we would go crazy with the monotony we didn't know i mean three weeks is a long time to spend on a boat a 40-foot boat with three other people so it was really the unknown that we were afraid of. But this time, I, I I personally felt that the crossing was broken up into more manageable pieces. We had more miles to do, but it was broken up into three separate passages. Bahamas to Bermuda, Bermuda to the Azores, and then the Azores to Portugal. And um, 
that to me felt psychologically I felt like it was more manageable even though actually the crossing especially uh, Bermuda to the Azores the two week two weeks 16, 16 day um, passage was more challenging <clears throat> in the end than our um, our three week Atlantic crossing going from east to west so anyway that's a very I feel like this is going to become very lengthy actually sure, this people, people will just switch off or fast forward yes. I think maybe if someone Actually, has got the can, watches it all through. Just put some dates, some timestamps in as to maybe, what the question. Yeah, maybe. We should can do I just that. point out just on what you said yeah. about breaking into manageable pieces? Manageable pieces. I think it took us sixteen days to do the first to do this that second leg. Yeah. But it took us only twenty one to do the the entire crossing before. Yeah. And I think with hindsight, we probably could have shaved two days off of that first crossing. Just uh, in sixteen day passage. No, the twenty one. All oh, right. We yeah. could have got in a couple of days earlier if we had sailed differently yeah maybe maybe we have we ha we, yeah maybe oh, that's that's possible. anyway that's that's um and the update. second part of martin's question is about fear yeah what are you afraid of we've uh, already sort of touched on that. my biggest fear apart from being sexually assaulted by a clown um <laughs> there's gonna be some psychologist watching this thing like, no, 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 can no, i no. offer you a free session <laughs> <laughs> or 10. <laughs> <laughs> my biggest fear is always coming off watch or coming on to watch and finding out that someone's missing. Yeah, I think that is by far my, my biggest fear. My, um, yeah, I feel like I could manage almost any situation as long as everyone was on board and safe. Yes. Um, but if we were to lose someone at sea, if there was a man overboard situation, then, you know, the chances of them being rescued are, are fairly slim. Um, you know, you don't have to kind of do a particularly lengthy Google search to, to have all these stories about, you know, man overboard situations that have ended in, in tragedy. Um, quite well, a few high, high profile ones recently. One happened yesterday. Oh, really? Yep. Where? Uh, Cow's Week. Some poor sod um, fell in and got tangled up in the main sheet overboard and drowned. Yeah, well, there you go. <coughs> um, you know, it's happened recently with the Volvo Ocean Race. It happened with the Clip Around the World Race. Um, you know, it happens a lot. So um, that is by far our biggest fear. Um, and to prevent that from ever happening, um, we are always tethered on, particularly when we are alone um, up in the cockpit, um, which is usually overnight, but even during the day. Um, and we... Well, Nick and I, when we're taking over from each other's watch, we always insist on watching the other person clip on so that we know that it's been done. And then I, when I'm on watch, I never leave the cockpit. I, I don't ever unclip. Um, I don't come downstairs unless I really desperately need to do something. You did to make bread the other day. Someone picked up an individual, like, why are you wearing your life jacket downstairs? I think you just went oh, to check okay. your bed. Yeah, well, so, okay, well, sometimes when it's daylight and mm -hmm. I have something to do and the, the boat isn't moving around very much, then I, 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 you know, do a risk assessment. And if, But the other thing is that um, because we've got a three-way tether, what do you call that? Like a three-point three po tether. Three tether yeah. um, we don't actually need to clip off. We can always be clipped on. You can move around the boat. Yeah. Okay, so I think that we, after... Um, how many minutes Ten is that? minutes. <laughs> Boom, this is going to be a long one. And I've discussed clowns already, so there's a bonus. Let's see what else we can weave we into this. Maybe breaking this up into more than one episode. Nah, it'd be grand. Someone will sit watching for two hours with yeah. matchsticks and I was going, Christ, you two. Anyway. Get on with it. Okay. Well done, this one's Martin. an easy one. This one is only going to take 30 seconds to answer. Joshua, also on Facebook, why don't you drink caffeine on passage? You do. I do. I don't. Yes. Two reasons. Firstly, as I've said this before, when you are sailing, uh, offshore you don't get to sleep a regular night's sleep you get six hours here and when you come off watch you've got six hours off if you get five hours of those asleep you're gonna be lucky because between getting up I always come on watch early so that make sure that I can you know the crew's got the the, the person coming off watch has got a chance to do things you know so you get five hours sleep and so you have to make up that sleep at some other time during the day. So we find we tend to find that we all doze around the cockpit or in bed. And if you drink caffeine, it stops you getting to sleep as quickly. I find that the first three days without caffeine are awful. Um, I end up with this really weird headache and it passes. And um, so that, that's my main reason. Second reason is that I find that caffeine or drinking coffee especially contributes to seasickness. I've always found that. So I don't drink coffee. Um, 
for that as a secondary reason. The upside to that is that when you get to the other end and you have your first caffeinated beverage, ooh, like seriously, it is like taking something you shouldn't take. <laughs> uh, and literally the buzz you get off of that is just, it's incredible. Like literally, yeah, don't we really answer that one? Yes, yeah, so I'm going to have to look at 30 seconds. <laughs> doesn't matter, doesn't matter. They won't notice. All right, next question is from Bill, who uh, commented on our, I think, first YouTube video about the crossing. Um, what makes the Code Zero so useful, and is it a trade name or style of sale? Now, we have loads of questions on sales, and I'm going to group them all together. So this will be the first of many questions about our sales and sales. Uh, <laughs> questions about Yay, sales! So the Code Zero is uh, an asymmetric spinnaker. It's a type of asymmetric spinner that is cut flat. Um, and I think the code zero is the, is the flattest cut of them all. And as such, it's just basically like a big flat Genoa. It's huge, it's about 150%. And it is designed for going up wind in light winds, in light airs. So um, it is phenomenal. When you get to use it properly, when, it, when you've got the conditions for it uh, to be used as an upwind sail, it is fantastic. Like if you saw our first video, we we were overtaking much bigger boats because we had a code zero. It only really works to about ten knots apparent, doesn't yeah. it? So yeah. it really is for light light winds. You know, you're looking at four to five knots, and you know, uh, of true going up wind to get to, before you have to take it down. Mm -hmm. um, fantastic sail, um, really good, and you can we fly it. We do fly it up to about ninety degrees, so we'll fly it to a beam. Um, but again, it, it, you, you, you can, once you get to 10 knots, it becomes, it, it, it overpowers the boat, the, the, the sails become unbalanced. The, the thing about Code Zero is you, you literally, the, the halyard has to be bar tight. Like literally, you, you crank it up and you really, really crank it. I actually put a, a, a Sharpie mark on the halyard to where it's got to be cranked to. But, because you always think, God, that's really tight. But then, yeah. Yeah, so um, yes, the Code Zero, um, and by the way, it's a style of sale, it's not a trade name, so different sale makers will make a Code Zero for you. Um, and kind of continuing with the sale theme, uh, a YouTube user called Rosy Pop uh, says, What sale for which wind speed? Um, so, as Nick said, it, it's not just about wind speed, it's about wind angle as well, um, but generally, our, our kind of suite of sales include the Code Zero. The parasailer, which we'll talk about a bit more in a minute, and then obviously our white sails, which is a jib and a kind of oversized mainsail. And generally, we try and just stick to our white sails because they're by far the easiest to use and manage, and we can, you know, use them in, in pretty much every single condition that you can think of. Um, but obviously, there are some situations where the Code Zero or the parasailer are definitely the best sails to use. Um, so the Code Zero is to be used in light winds, as Nick said, anything less, any apparent wind that's less than 10 knots. And we really, it's kind of between 60 and probably 100 degrees that we use the Code Zero. Uh, yeah. But, yeah. Maybe a bit, a bit deeper than 100 you, degrees, but mainly... Yeah, probably 50, 45 and 50. Yeah. When it was new, it's a couple of years old now and it's stretched a little bit. Yeah, kind of on the beam or slightly forward of the beam is um, probably the most comfortable point of sail for that sail. And as we said, you know, we we, um, we found on our crossing when we were using the, the Code Zero that in nine knots of wind, we were doing seven knots of speed. So it's really, really effective. Um, the Parasailer uh, can be used what, about 120 degrees and deeper? But you can use it at 90, you can use it on the beam yeah. up all the way to symmetrically, fully downwind. Yeah, but we, we don't really use it on the beam um, very often. No. If the wind is strong enough, rather if the wind is too strong to use a code zero, then we would just use a white sails if yep. we had wind on the beam because the boat sails quite effectively when we've got wind on the beam anyway. So using the parasailer isn't really necessary. We do sail like a pair of pussies. <laughs> That's and it true. Just, we're, not, we're not hardcore racers. So no. We talked to some chap um, who had a swan when we were doing the arc and he was like, yeah, I don't reef. And he went north and he, he went a long way north yeah. and he got his, well, we would have had our asses handed to us. He was like, yeah, I don't reef. He goes, because if I reef, um, 
I can't sleep because then I'm worried that I need to shake the reef out yeah. and the boat's going too slow. And he won everything. I mean, he was like, a, he must have been 60 years of age and yeah. like probably, he was a big chap as well. Rather a plump man, yes. Nice man, but yeah. You know, <laughs> but then you're sitting there thinking, bloody hell. Yeah. You know, we, you know, if our tea towels start flapping on the back <laughs> rail, I'll put a reef in. <laughs> Um, so yes, um, that I hope answers that question and of course, um, yeah, white sails are to be used in, in almost every other condition apart from what we've just discussed. Um, continuing with the sail theme, um, another YouTube user called Tonewreck1, I think, uh, says, <laughs> what is your view on the parasailer? Was it worth the investment? Indeed. I wish I could come up with simple answers for all this. Yeah. Um, the way we use it, no. That's a, I don't think it was worth the investment. No. Um, we don't use it enough. We don't use it enough because we sail short-handed and just to be absolutely frank, it terrifies me that, that sail. Oh, I don't, yeah, I don't find it particularly terrifying. I mean, at first I did, yes, um, but it, you know, as we've kind of grown used to it, it's, it's less scary. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you know, the way you run it, you know, we started running it with four lines, then we run it with three lines, and then we run it with just two lines, of which one is fixed to a, a you know, the tack is fixed, so it literally is runs like an asymmetric. Yeah. It is a good sail. I think that personally, I think they come into their own if you fly them off a catamaran, because you fly, you know, one corner of the sail off of each bow, and therefore the, the thing is a lot more stable. And the problem with them, the parasailer in itself, is that. Getting it up isn't too much of a problem, getting it down isn't too much of a problem. I'm just going to come up with some little hints there because we, there's some little tips that we found about flying power sailors. But it's just the storage. It is a really, really big sail, even when compressed. It's huge and we struggle to get it into a lock on a 40 foot boat. Then we struggle to get it out of the locker. It's quite heavy. And so actually, you know, when you're sitting there thinking, shall we get it out? Shall we fly it? You've really got to be on a long passage, I think. Absolutely. I mean, it will take from deciding to fly the power sailor to actually having the parasailer flying, uh, for us would take at least half an hour. And probably 45 minutes when we're running four To lines. 45 minutes, exactly. Um, and when we first started using it, it would take us about an hour. Yeah, so that's, yeah, so from our point of view, what we're using for on a 40 foot monohull, I would probably give my time again, I wouldn't buy one. They're brilliant sails, they are absolutely brilliant, but um, because they've got a slot in them, they're not as efficient, so they're not for racers. Um, I think if we ever end up with a catamaran, we'll definitely get a power sailor. Yeah, and, and just to um, kind of continue on that, that line of thinking, um, another YouTube user called Plumsy, Plumshy, something like that. Plumshy. <laughs> um, says, how would you change your sail plan? I.e., would you get a cutter, cutter rig as opposed to a power sailor? Which is a good question. Uh, I think, for, for me, I, I think that if we were to get um, another minor hole especially, but even maybe a catamaran, uh, we would definitely get a cutter rig because then, yeah, you may not need a parasailer and you can manage everything from the cockpit, it's just a lot easier. Um, so yeah, if you have a cutter rig, then obviously for those of you who aren't already aware of this, you could fly both your four sails out kind of goose winged and then you've still got a lot of sail up and it's a lot easier to manage. Agreed. Um, yeah, the sale, put it this way, if, if I had to, if we get to buy another, well, when we get to buy another boat, if it's a monohull, there's cutter rig and there's solent rig, which are slightly different terms. So a cutter rig has an inner forestay with a dedicated smaller, kind of like, smaller foresail. Yeah. Whereas a solent rig has the two, uh, has two forestays very close together, one of which normally flies like a light air sail, like a uh, Code Zero. Um, I would want a cutter rig, um, or a solent rig actually, it depends on the size of the foredeck because essentially if you've got a baby stay that's got like the, you, you, you've got an inner stay, you are going to minimise, you can't store your dinghy there, mm. so you have to have a really quite big boat to be able to do the boat effectively, and I don't like davits on long passages. So yes, I would want a cutter rig, and I think that because of the way that catamarans sail, I think you'd be foolish to have a catamaran without it. Either a solent rig. I think there's solent rigs on catamarans. Okay. So yeah, you need, you do need a big, a big kind of asymmetric on a catamaran because they've got such small mainsails. Mm, yeah. Yes. That's my answer. Exactly. Even if we had a, a Genoa, we might not use a parasailer as much. Uh, I, look, 
I suppose the thing is it's to do with efficiency. If you're a racing sailor and everything's about efficiency, as you should be as a cruising sailor, you know, I, I think we would use a power sailor more. I think the problem with our power sailor is that if we had, if say for instance we had a massive like sail locker in the bow, mm. and we could just pull it up and hoist it, we'd use it a lot more. Yeah, it is literally convenience. Yeah. Uh, um, and the thing is, you know, if it takes an hour to get up, you really need to be flying it for. You're gonna be flying it for a long while to make yeah. it efficient. Yeah. Although saying that, across the Atlantic, once we got it out of the locker, once we left it on the fore deck for two and a half weeks, we still didn't use it. I remember watching a Gone with the Winds episode where they were in Panama, I think, and they were literally going, I think, maybe five miles away from where they, like, to an anchorage five miles away, and they put their parasailer up. And I just remember thinking, that is dedication. We wouldn't have even had the engine on. <laughs> we wouldn't even put any sails up. <laughs> I was like, good on you guys. Well done you. Okay. Um... Yeah, okay. So Jason asks, do you like the combo of the Code Zero and Paras Parasailer? And would you recommend purchasing both sails or going with one over the other? If you have if you've got a if you've got a big main driven boat, and the, the thing that you have to understand is the sail plan of the boat that you have. We have a huge main and we have a very small jib, and that's the way with a lot of modern production boats where you especially where you need a self-tacker. People love self-tacking jibs because you haven't got a tack. And Yes, it's useful if we buy another boat, when we buy another boat. self tackle I don't think, I think we'll just take it off. It's such an inefficient sale. Mm -hmm. um, and the, they jib. the jib, yeah, yeah. the self tacking jib. So um, you need something in between, or it's kind of light winds, and as you said, the Code Zero is fantastic. The thing about the Code Zero is it comes on a furler, so it's actually much easier to, to kind of furl yeah. away. Um, so my, for this boat, um, if we had to buy one additional sail, it'd be a self tack. It'd be a code zero. Yeah, rather than a power sail. Rather than a power sail. Yeah, I agree. You can run a code. Sorry, you can fly a code zero um, deeper than a hundred degrees or so. You can you can fly it running downwind or or. It's just inefficient. It's just less efficient. Well, we have a power sailor, so we don't need to yeah. make that choice. But yeah. you can use code zero um, downwind. Absolutely. Um. Okay. Cool. They're the questions regarding sales, so apologies for those who... For those of you still <laughs> tuned in, well done, you all go and chug a beer. For those of you who don't chug beer, or you're not into beer, drink your coffee. I'll have a little bit of sparkling water. Yes. By the way, if I look like I've been crying, I've just got some weird allergies on my throat. <laughs> He's just been giving me beats on the side. <laughs> okay. Ian asks... How would you deploy a sea anchor or drogue? Nick, how would we deploy a sea anchor or drogue? Um, we, would, we would rig a bridle, um, probably from the stern. Mm -hmm. Well, for, for a drogue, mm -hmm. sea anchor being the other way around. Um, yeah, I think a bridle. I think the thing, we've never had to use one in anchor. No. And hopefully we never will. Um, so yeah, we'd rig a bridle and um, run it off two lines. Cool. That answers that, I suppose. Yeah. I, I, like I said, it's ho hopefully something we'll never have to do, but if we ever do high latitude sailing or kind of like big crossings, that you know, we will try and find a way of, we'd actually go and, we have, a, we have one under yeah. the bed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, But as, as with our storm sails, they are very, very clean and new. <laughs> and we intend to keep them that way. Well, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Ian also asks a completely different question, which is, what do we cook in our pressure cooker when we're under sail? We cook pretty much everything in the pressure cooker. I think look, we had some, um, when we first got to the Caribbean, our friend Magda, she's like, have you got a pressure cooker? We're like, nah. And she's like, you've got to go and buy a pressure cooker. And we were like, all right, fair enough. They are amazing. They are totally amazing. When we first bought our pressure cooker, like we put it on the gas and then we both went and hid <laughs> behind the bolt case in case it exploded. Uh, they were, and they are, they really changed the quality of life on our boat. Um, for the following reasons. Mm -hmm. Firstly, you put it on the gas or you put it on the cooker and the lid can't fall off, which basically means it's safer at sea. Secondly, and this is the important thing, it cooks things really, really quickly. So it will cook probably in a third to a quarter of the time than another, a dish would cook um, if you had, didn't have it in a fresh cooker, which means that you use, you use a lot less gas. And secondly, um, you don't heat the boat up, which is really important in, in warmer climes. 
And the third thing is it transforms really kind of what could be like really tough cuts of meat into like amazing dishes. Like for instance, we eat a lot of curry, but you can take like chuck steak, like really tough steak, throw it in a pressure cooker like to make a Thai curry. And in 25 minutes, it's like as tender as stuff that's been slow cooked for five hours. Mm -hmm. So it really is amazing. So what we do is we just make a Thai curry, stick it on for 20 minutes and then open it up, test it to make it taste it and then basically take, put, take another metal bowl with rice and water in it and put it in for another three minutes and it's done so we, uh, we get we get to eat faster <laughs> that's really it i mean we make all sorts in there we make um curries obviously casserole but i mean you we, we roasted a chicken in there once before yeah apparently you can bake cakes in a pressure cooker i've never the washing tried up that myself yeah, horrendous. um and you i mean we, when we were in um in the caribbean you used to put uh, what was it? What kind of meat was it that you, you It was always in there? Just cheap steak or something. Or pork, um, pork steaks yeah. or whatever. You, yeah, it, it's very, very good at tenderizing meat very, yeah. very quickly. So, I mean, you know, you can pr pretty much put anything in there and it will come out kind of reasonable. So, um, Mike asks, how do we mentally deal with a long passage at sea? And I think that the answer to that isn't particularly clear cut because, as some of you have. Uh, observed on our um, videos recently of us kind of doing these longer longer passages it is actually mentally really draining and there's been a few um, kind of blithe comments from people who I don't know kind of whether they've done this kind of crossing before but maybe who didn't quite understand the, the mental and psychological stress that that uh, doing a, a long passage puts you under a there's a constant worry of something going wrong, uh, whether that's a breakage on the boat, whether that's some bad weather coming in, whether that's someone getting ill, <laughs> I mean, something more catastrophic like someone falling overboard or, you know, ending up in an electrical storm and getting hit by lightning. You know, there's all these things that could go wrong from the very minor to the catastrophic and you're constantly on the alert for, for something to happen. Um, B, even on the most comfortable of conditions you do not get anywhere near the amount of sleep that you're used to um, so we had three people uh, on the boat during this most recent crossing and we ran a watch system of uh, three hours on six hours off and that just rotated through 24 hours so during the day there was no difference it was three up three on six off which meant that effectively in absolute ideal conditions you got maybe five hours sleep at a time but this never really happened because there would inevitably be something that woke you up during your off watch whether it's Nick climbing into bed next to me or whether it's you know the boat kind of going over a wave or whether it's something clanking or whatever so you were always just snatching kind of short amounts of sleep and as anyone who's been sleep deprived before which is probably every single person watching this video it really affects your mental state and suddenly something that is really quite small and insignificant can become insurmountable it can become a, a source of great stress or just I mean you know I remember on this crossing I felt like I was I kind of dealt with it mentally fairly well but I remember on our first crossing which was three weeks at sea um, you know, there were times when I just, I felt like I was literally about to go crazy. Like, I felt like I was losing my mind. Um, and I'm usually a pretty level-headed kind of person. So, what? No. <laughs> no. You carry on. No one on we'll just edit this bit out. <laughs> am I or am I not a level-headed person? Yes, very. Yes. Am I? Mm. You have your moments. <laughs> Um, so the question is, how do we mentally deal with a long passage at sea? Uh, I think that you have to prepare for it in advance. You have to really be aware of what you're you're going to be coming. You know. You sound uh, like Kung Fu Panda. Why? Doesn't that just kind of? How do I sound like Kung Fu Panda? I'm just joking. Being facetious as always. But I don't. I don't understand. The... It's like a Zen master preparing it. Oh, I see. <laughs> okay, so I <I'm> watch <laughs> too much Kung Fu Panda. Um, yes, you have to prepare yourself mentally. You have to take plenty of things to do. Um, I mean, for me, it was books. I had way too many books, although I read almost all of them. Uh, you know, we had movies that we downloaded. I had loads of YouTube videos that I downloaded. So just stuff that is going to keep you occupied, take your mind off it. And um, yeah, at the end of the day, you're probably going to have a few moments where you just absolutely hate your life. But 
you will have a lot of moments where you're thinking, my God, I'm so lucky to be able to experience <clears throat> something so rare and so amazing. And there is something incredibly special that I can't even come close to putting into words about being on a boat in the middle of the ocean, especially for me when I'm on my night watch, it's just me, I know everyone else is asleep, in the cockpit, and it's me and, and the night and the ocean, and it's just the most special thing in the world. So it's all worth it, but sometimes it, it can be um, a little mentally challenging. Uh, yeah, I agree with everything you said. Um, Excellent. Hang on a second. <laughs> hang on a minute. I've always got something to add. I know you do. <laughs> How long is this going to take us? Well, I reckon anything between 2 and 40 minutes. I'm going to take a drink. All right. So psychologically, I would say um, the thing that I was thought about afterwards is that because you have so little stimulation, like normally if you're in in kind of the modern world, you've got like things to do, you've got a job to do, you've got like social media, you've got TVs and stuff. You tend to find that I, I think the small things affect you a lot more at sea. Mm -hmm. Like, I've, I mean... Um, the, that, the, we had one day on passage where I think our average speed was like two knots yeah. and it really affected all of us Yeah. and nowadays, you know, I'm sitting here thinking well, why did we all get affected by it yeah. so badly and um, as a yardstick Shiner, who is, you know, one of my greatest friends, but he's been sailing for like Forever. Yeah, forever. Yeah. And he's he's just he was saying I find it really hard to deal with this, and that was his first ocean passage, his first long offshore passage. And, and just to clarify, that particular day, I remember it was it was an awful day. The weather was nice, everything was good, um, but we were only doing two knots of boat speed, and that's because we had so much current against us. So we had the engine running. For those of you who are like, well, why don't you just turn the engine on? We had the engine running. We had the sails all up. We had enough wind. You know, well, I don't know yeah, how much we, wind we had, make, but it was fine. We couldn't make progress. We had, uh, I think our water speed was something like five and a half, six knots, but our actual speed over ground was... Yeah, we, two, we, we picked up knots. this really foul current. Um, anyway, so I think psychologically, things do affect you um, a lot more. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that's all I have to say. Okay. Okay, um, so a really good question um, that a few people have um, messaged us with. Um, in particular, um, Peter and Captain Seven Seas. Uh, what is the primary benefit of being in a pack like the Ark versus going at it alone? Um, which is an excellent question and one I'm glad that people are interested in. Um, I have, uh, I think that we've done two Ark rallies now. We have did the Ark, the Ark, the original Ark, which is the Canaries to St. Lucia um, in 2015. And we've now done the Ark Europe. And I think that um, there, there were two uh, very different experiences, both positive, but uh, just to kind of expand a little bit on, on our first crossing, and again, um, you know, I'll, I'll link to the, the blog post below for those of you who want to read more about it. I, if we were to cross the Atlantic again from east to west, I don't think that we would hesitate in doing the arc. It was such a fantastic experience. Yep. We uh, arrived in uh, Las Palmas in, in the Canaries, in Gran Canaria, um, about three weeks before departure. As we've already said, we were feeling quite nervous about crossing the Atlantic, and um, so there was that kind of, the, the element of having a lot of support there that we appreciated. But what we didn't realise we were going to kind of get out of it was the uh, kind of social aspect. I mean, we were on a pontoon where every single person on the pontoon, or every single boat on the pontoon was, was participating in the rally. Uh, and every single night there was some kind of event, some, most of which were kind of, you, you didn't have to go to if you didn't want to, they weren't compulsory. But almost everyone went anyway. And not only did it give you a chance to meet other people who you would be sailing across the ocean with, but and obviously, you know, all of the kind of stress relief that comes along with with talking to people who are about to go through the same experience as you. But it also made um, the it, it added so much value to the experience. And when I say that, what I mean is, I mean, I can't remember how much it, it cost. I think you can look up the, the price on, on their website. Uh, but we and this is no exaggeration. We consumed and drank the cost of our entrance fee in booze and, and, and food. I mean, we th there was free food and free booze every single night for about three weeks. Um, Not every night, but most nights there was something Most going nights. On. And there were three, no, 
yeah, three parties that we attended. There was Arc Plus party, which I don't think we were strictly meant to go to, but we went to anyway. Um, then there was the Arc welcome party, and then there was the Arc leaving party. Um, and they were fantastic events, weren't they? They were a lot Open of fun. bars. Yeah, exactly. And there was other, there were like dress up parties as well. There were like dinners. There was every single night, there was like a happy hour yeah, where, cool. where you got like two drinks and there was some kind of, you know, other, there's, you know, it was entertainment good. Plus, there or whatever. There's all the lectures, there's free lectures, free exactly. seminars. Exactly. So apart from the social aspect, there's, uh, they prepare you in, in, in the form of lectures and seminars that go on for about a week before yeah. your departure. Um, on every aspect of, of ocean crossing, whether it's like, you know, how to download weather, what kind of weather you can expect, how to sail downwind, um, how to provision, all that kind of stuff. So that was a really, really fantastic experience. And I, we, even though I don't think that we would need the um, kind of psychological support if we did it again, I feel like just the, the fun, you know, the, the, it was so much fun. The social aspect. We would do it again for sure. Plus, in addition to that, they give the weather, they do weather routing for you in case yeah. you haven't paid for your answers, and they fit track. They 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 lend you or loan you a tracker so that your track your position is known. Yes. Just I will say, we're, we're not paid by the arc the arc to do this. The, the w well, well, I mean, and that brings me on to my my second um, kind of thoughts on on the arc, which is I feel like that experience with the arc contrasts with the arc Europe because even though it was. A very positive experience we got the social aspect we had the the weather out well, it's not weather routing it's weather um you, they just give you the weather um and we had obviously the ssb net which we showed on the videos which was fantastic because you get to talk to other people who are also at sea and it's a really good kind of morale boost um i personally would feel a little uh, hesitant to do the arc europe again purely because the weather window that we had was perfect however the weather in um, for, for that particular crossing is not nearly as stable as the the weather that you get going in the other direction. Um, so going from east to west, you have kind of downwind, kind of trade wind sailing, almost guaranteed. Going the other way around, from west to east, um, there's no guarantee of weather whatsoever. Um, it all depends on the Azores high, which I've I've explained in the videos. So, therefore. I think that you really have to pick your departure date from Bermuda fairly carefully. You can only obviously get about seven days of weather, but even so. We were lucky, the weather that we left in was fantastic and we had pretty good weather the whole way. Uh, but I am friends with other um, sailors who have done the same crossing, who left a week or two later or a month later, and they came up against really horrendous weather. And had you been um, kind of had you had to stick to a particular departure date as you do with the rallies then if there's if the weather doesn't suit you then you can either let the rally go and, and wait for as weather, some boats did on the world arc as yes as happens sometimes um or you you leave in weather that you're not comfortable with so for that reason alone i would um probably be wary of doing the arc europe again just for that reason but I would certainly recommend arc rallies in general. I think, I suppose, I think it's probably a little bit harsh, as a, but I think that as long as you are willing to turn around and say, actually, no, this isn't right for us and pull out. Which can be hard to do when you paid an entrance fee. Yes, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I do. And, and there's uh, social pressure, like all well, these boats around you to leave. You don't want to, you know, kind yeah, no, of be agreed. the only one agreed, to be like, agreed. Oh, I And in all fairness, go. we had the same experience on the arc. I did say, I went into the office the day before and said, you've got to put delay this rally departure the weather is weather forecast is horrendous and they didn't no they didn't but yeah. and we had 40 knots of wind on the foot i know it was well, fine yeah i know okay yeah i agree okay and one thing yes i agreed i think that yes the fact that you cannot they very very rarely delay the departure is something against them i think if you were to put in the positives and the negatives column i think the overall it's it's it is a positive yeah it is a big positive yeah doing a, doing, doing a rally yeah. And I think that it, it, it's the nature of rallies that you don't get to choose your date, your departure date. Um, but um, I, I disagree with you. I think I, given it our time again, I would still do it again. But I think this will now be, I think I have enough confidence as a skipper now to be able to say, actually, no, we're not leaving. And I'm not sure I would have done the first time. Mm. So I think that's it. So there you go. Andrew asks, is your hydrovane your primary steering method while under passage? 
No, but it is... Um... Well, actually, yes. I would say it is. I think it is our primary work method of steering. It, yeah, it's it's not our only method of steering, but it's the one that we use yeah, the most. Yeah, it's our primary, yes. and I would I would we have an autopilot as a secondary, as a backup more yeah. than anything else, or for when we're motor sailing. Yeah. Um, I as I've said before, I would not sail offshore in a monohull, um, and I say monohull because we don't have a catamaran, and I don't know much about catamarans. I don't think you can put self steer onto them, no. but uh, I would not sail offshore. Um, for any length of time with a short, a small crew without self steer. Yeah. Absolutely. It, it just it just wouldn't happen. Yes, we love our self steer. Um, and do we have the keel fully lowered when we are under sail? Yes, we do. Um, strangely enough, mid passage, we were reading about it in Jimmy Cornell's book, and he's like, well, you should actually have the keel in different positions for different points of sail, especially. Um, and we'll probably try this out. He was saying that when you've got like um, swell on the beam and you've got this really kind of, the motion of the boat is really kind of not very, not very nice. If you raise the keel a lot, you kind of fall down the waves rather than kind of getting knocked. So it was something to try. Yeah, I thought it was more downwind. It stops that rolling. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Anyway, yes, we do have the keel fully lowered. Um, John asks, in the case of an emergency that took out your GPS and radio, what would you do to navigate? So the most likely scenario here would be a lightning strike, which um, does happen every now and again. Um, Nick? Uh, even if we were hit by lightning, we have, I think, probably eight to ten GPS units on this boat. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so we've got, you know, apart from the fact we've got a plotter, which is our primary, we've got a secondary plotter, so secondary. We have uh, four independent um, smartphones, because if you, you know, I've got two, you've got one, Shiner's got one. They all have GPS in them. Mm. Our yellow brick tracker has GPS in it. And these are all devices. I mean, the yellow brick tracker, I think, probably would come into its own because it, the battery lasts one charge will last six to eight months. It never runs out of bloody battery, that thing. <laughs> and it's waterproof. Mm. So even if we were hit by lightning, we've always got GPS handy. Yeah. Um, I know that the purists will go, oh, you should, like, well, you should have a sextant. We probably should have a sextant. And we looked into buying one, but you know, that they need a lot of work. You know, you've got to learn to use them. And I'm not adverse to learning, but I've never used one before. And really as a fix, you know, You've got to. You've got, it's one of those things. You've got to practice it to get used to it, to get mm. to get good at it. I think in the scenario where mid Atlantic, so during a passage, we lost all our GPS. Like someone threw them all overboard. Um, we would essentially, well, we'd navigate. We'd actually use a compass. Yeah. We'd use a compass. We'd have to, you know, sit down and work out currents, how far we were being pushed, work out leeway, and try and work out our position. Um, just using using that method, mm -hmm. and understand that there was going to be there would be a huge a huge error mm. in uh, in where we were. Uh, also, assuming that we had no GPS, but we still had a VH, we could have a handheld yeah. radio. Yeah, there is enough shipping that we would be within radio range of for us to call up a ship and say, "Can you give us a position?" Yeah, and uh, we also have an EPR, which if we you know kind of lost everything and we were in the middle of the ocean and it was unsafe, um, then we would consider. Um, activating the EPUB. Well, I, I disagree with you. I don't. Well, think... if we're hit by lightning. No. 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 I, I disagree with you completely on that. Mm -hmm. I don't think a lightning strike um, warrants an EPUB. I think that's that's that. that well, I, if the boat was still seaworthy, and we didn't have water ingress. Yeah. If we had a if we had a what's called a dark boat, so we had no electricity, with nothing. Yeah. Um, we would not activate the EPUB. No. So as long as we could sail, mm -hmm. and as long as the rudders were intact, and yeah. as long as the crew, if, even if the rudders weren't intact, as long as we had sails, I would keep the boat going. I think I think uh, using an EPUB in that case is a totally unnecessary. Well, it's it's um, it wouldn't be necessary um, because you know as long as I mean we always, for example, carry water, so we would have we wouldn't be relying on our water maker for water. Yep. Um, you know we would have enough food. We'd still have gas if we had to cook our food. Um, Even if we didn't, we just eat cold food, eat tin food, eat cold tin food. Mm. I mean, I suppose this is, this, is, this is, you know, Skipper's planning. What if, what if, what if, mm. what if? You know, we have enough handheld battery operated 
things like GPS and VHF radios so that we you know and they're all they're all held in kind of sealed bags so we have a sealed uh, Ziploc bag with a VHF radio and multiple sets of batteries for it which aren't in the unit so we can yeah so you know yeah I, I, no we would never we the boat we would have to be in grave danger for me to push the e-plug okay um timothy asks with just two of you on board how do you manage night watches well we had three people on on now crossing but sometimes obviously we do do longer crossings with just the two of us and what we have found and i think it really depends on the couple and, and what suits them but what we have found is to be flexible with our watches and in practice what that means is that uh i think nick you normally do i normally do like the sunset watch and then i stay up kind of as late as i can maybe 11 o'clock midnight you do the next watch and then get me up before dawn is that how we do it no the, the arrangement that we have is that we do four on, four off formally. That's kind of the arrangement. So we norm with three, we do three on, three off. With two of us, we do four on, four off. Yeah, but we never stick and to it's, that. And it's, it's a really loose arrangement, that four yeah. on, four off. So, for instance, in a situation where... what we So how we would normally try and do it, assuming that everything's okay, I will um, do four. And then if I'm still... If after four hours I'm still okay, I'll stay up longer and let Teresa sleep and on the very rare instances where I'm like I just can't stay awake any longer I'll get her up yeah so in practice that that turns into you doing a watch in the middle of the night and me doing the watches yes yeah. and we know side. loads of couples where one one party just does the night watches just stays up all night and that's probably for couples that don't get on too well <laughs> they only meet each other at watch chains uh, Richard asks Nick this is a question that we get asked a lot so I did include it in the Q&A what brand and model sunglasses are you wearing they are Oakleys. They're not Oakley frog skins. They are. Hang on a minute. Shit. What's that say? Um, Stringer. Stringer. Oakley Stringers. They are essentially almost the same as Oakley frog skins, only the arms are straight. I just happen to like them. Philip asks How do you get your weather forecast, SSB or SAP phone? Uh, sat phone. Sat phone. We, did, we have SSB and you know I got some grief on the, on YouTube yesterday. We were like, well SSB, you've got all your information about SSB wrong. No, I haven't. Um, sat phone is far easier to use, although not not as easy as like, using the internet when you're on land. So sat phone, we get grid files. Grid files are very, very small packets of information. So they're, 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 the file size is small and you just essentially uh, put them into a grip file viewer on a tablet or a phone. So yeah, we use sat phone. Yeah, and, and um, continuing on from that, uh, Bruce asks, what weather apps do you use? And Paul asks, how do you get weather at sea without using lots of data, i.e. is there special software? Yes, there is. So most weather, whether you're using any of the apps, um, we use Weather 4D on our tablet and we use, what's the one we use? Um, we use another app. On our on our Mac, but they're just Grib viewers. So if you if you Google Grib file viewer, you'll get all sorts of different incarnations. And what you do is you just take you download a Grib file from the, an email and then kind of import it into the Grib file viewer, and it will show you, you know, what the weather is. The difference here is that the Grib file viewer is the is the is the piece of software that interprets the the, the Grib file and puts all the colours in and all the fancy animations. The actual Grib file itself is a real it's quite small. So, with practice, you can use about one minute of satellite data, actually maximum, to to get to download a Grib file. Um, in fact, w less now because you have to practice. You really do have to practice getting your satellite communications. And just a, a tip here: never go offshore without understanding how your sat phone works fully and having used it and practiced it many times. It is also important you've got compression software for your uh, emails installed on your computer or we have a router which already has hardware compression in it to stop you kind of accidentally downloading crazy amounts of data. Yeah, we actually did a video about communications at sea which um, kind of expanded on this subject a little yeah, bit more. So, if, sorry, oh, if people need more We'll info. link to that up yeah. above. And we can always do a, you know, a, a, a talk on it. Carl asks, how do you balance the risk versus reward aspect of weather? 
i.e. if you saw some nasty weather approaching but it would shave let's say four days off your passage would you make that call okay <laughs> I think the thing is that any boat can only go so fast so our boat we really once we start hitting kind of seven and a half knots the motion of the boat becomes extremely uncomfortable and that's when we really start not enjoying ourselves so the kind of kind of the best speed for us uh, is probably at about six and a half knots the boat's still comfortable but we're making good speed so with that in mind it doesn't really make much of a difference whether we have 20 knots of wind because we can still make six and a half knots or 40 knots of wind because all right we might surf down a few waves and hit 15 knots but we'll probably still only be hitting seven and a half knots so I don't think that there'll be many scenarios where really nasty weather would propel us along to the point where it would shave a significant amount of time off of our journey compared to more moderate weather that was still windy enough to, to reach those speeds of about six and a half, seven knots. So with that in mind, no, we would, I think, my kind of personal opinion would be to stay within uh, kind of a, a, a weather range that gave us ideally 15 to 20 knots, you know, up to 25 knots is still fine. Um, but it's really more about sea state. I mean, you can have pretty windy conditions, but it's a sea state that is really uncomfortable. Um, and that's when you start not being able to sleep at night. And we kind of discovered this on our crossing between um, the Azores and Portugal and that video again I'll link to up above um, that's when you start really really not enjoying yourself and we live by kind of the, the um, theory that if we are happy on the boat we are well rested we are comfortable then we're going to enjoy the passage to us speed is uh, kind of a secondary consideration yeah, I agree. Look, if we were like 12 hairy blokes in a race crew where your entire kind of ethos is get there as fast as possible, then you push the boundaries. The way that we think is like we could get across the ocean like much, much faster. And if we wanted to get there much, much faster, we'd fly across the ocean and save probably 99% of the money we'd invested in the boat by <laughs> flying first class back and forth. If you want to sail, you are kind of committed to going slow compared to other forms of transport. That's a slightly glib answer. What I would say is that for shorthanded crews, um, doing long passages, it's all fair and well when you're kind of like doing a round the cans race or you know a race that goes on for eight hours, even two days. Um, you can put up with sleep deprivation and being uncomfortable, but the problem that you have is that when you're uncomfortable for days upon days upon days, apart from the fact that it's just it's not pleasant. It's important to understand that that's when you start to make mistakes. You hear about all these events, um, tragic events um, on like long races, and you think, oh, so, you know, someone unclipped, someone got hit by the boom, someone got killed. And these are, in many cases, experienced sailors. And you think, why would they do that? But you're thinking about this when you're sat in an armchair, right, thinking, you know, well, that's not what you should do. You have to understand that sleep deprivation, you know, if any of you have had kids, you know, haven't slept for days or weeks on end because your child doesn't stop crying. You know, sleep deprivation just makes you just, it messes your mind up. And, you know, you hear about this, you know, the expression overcome by events. It tends to be that something, you know, one small event will lead to a bigger event, to lead to a bigger event. And all of a sudden you've created a real problem for yourself and your sailing. Um, and it just, you know, for instance, uh, you know, we had we almost blew up our electronic autopilot while we were on um, on passage, and it was because um, we were just tired. We were just really tired, and just it was just like uh, luckily we managed to reset it, and but we didn't, and we didn't burn anything out. But that would have meant that if we had lost that and we had no wind, we would have had to hand steer which would have meant that we were even more tired, which then leads to you just creating another set of problems. Yeah. So. Paul asks uh, another question, which is, if you did the crossing again, what would you do differently? Nothing. Yeah, I don't think that there's anything. Nothing. There's no. nothing. I think... We had this question a couple of times, and there really wasn't anything that I could think no, of. No, I don't think there's... 
maybe the only, these are just small things. Maybe we would have just sailed a slightly different course. But again, no, we nothing. did the best we could with the information yeah, we had. Yeah. Uh, Anders uh, didn't understand what you did to fix the chaffed halyard. I probably will run to just do a, another technical Tuesday on this. Um, essentially, you can buy from good marine chandlers. It looks like sausage casing. It's literally Kevlar. It's a Kevlar sheath. And what you do is you cut the length. If you've got um, a, Dine a Dyneema line where the outer part is frayed, you literally just put um, this Kevlar sheath over it and sew it on. And it, it, the structure integrity is the same and there's no more chaff. Mm -hmm. And because it's, it's very, very thin, it will still pass through blocks. That's it. And Peter says, uh, what brand life jackets do you use? And do they have PLBs, which is personal locator beacons? Um, they are Spinlock Deck Vest 5Ds, and we bought them because they were meant to be the most comfortable. Wearing a life jacket is not as comfortable as not wearing a life jacket, but here you go. Um, the, we have PLBs and AIS, transp um, AIS trans transponders in them. Yeah. yeah. Frank asks, what is your alcohol policy during ocean crossings? We have a policy whereby we have one drink uh, a day, which is not because I have a a need for alcohol in my system it's just nice you know and we've got to get to all this bush beer as well at some point. <laughs> but no we we it's i think for morale as, I, as we discussed in a previous question it's really keeping morale up on a long crossing is far more important than trying to keep morale up in any other situation i've ever encountered Absolutely. because psychologically little things will knock you hugely so we found that sitting down for dinner firstly we always eat together we have one meal where we always eat together because in the morning there's always the off watch will be on, on asleep at lunch you know people have, have different dietary comments but we always try and sit down before dark and have a meal together and have one drink together and that you know it became the highlight of our day yeah you know it's just been out to sit down and just have a gas and just yeah. sit you know we've we've seen each other we know we you know we're, we're always within 12 meters of one another <laughs> But to sit down and have one beer, um, you know, and they're not kind of crazy strength Belgian, you know, beers. They're like, you know, regular strength beer. Well, they were, they were bush beer. Six <laughs> percent. Um, so yeah, I don't think I don't think that is ever detriment to to anyone to to the career at all. Yeah. I, I I would I understand completely dry boats. Um, I also understand. I don't I don't think people should be drinking on passage. Um, at all, even off watch, even if you're not just off watch for the entire day, mm. I think that um, you know there are some big crews where you know you get a day off once a week, or the you know the, the skipper um, doesn't take watch because the skipper's on duty all the time. I, I, I don't think it's safe in the case of a, any sort of emergency or drama for someone to be inebriated. Yeah. That's just my take, and I suppose the thing is that you know these sailing boats across oceans are like little microcosms. You have your own way of doing things, mm -hmm. and you do things hopefully the, for the for the benefit of the crew. Mm -hmm. There you go. There you go. That was our last question. Really? Yeah. That went quickly. Yeah. Did it, Did it go quickly? No, an hour. Ooh. <laughs> okay. So listen, thank you so much for watching. Um, we hope that was really useful for you. All I would say is kind of like, as such, what a, sum up what your thoughts on this crossing. Um, my thoughts in summary was that it was a challenging crossing. Um, it was far more challenging than doing it the other way, uh, as in from the Canaries to the Caribbean. Because on that crossing, all you had to do was set the sails up for downwind sailing, and, and that was it. You had downwind, like 20 knots of downwind sailing for three weeks. This crossing, even though the conditions were only occasionally uh, kind of tiring or difficult, as in we didn't have many days of strong winds or big, you know, kind of uncomfortable sea states, just the constant change in weather. Uh, it, it was a challenge. We were constantly putting up different sails, um, turning the engine on, turning the engine off, uh, downloading the weather obviously every day and really having to study the weather was, that was coming through so that we could prepare ourselves for um, what route to take. Uh, if you were following us on the um, on the World Cruising Club website, they have they had like a tracking system and you can see the route that we took. Um, we were changing our our route all the time. We were constantly kind of bearing 
uh, or ch changing our heading constantly to, to account for local weather, weather conditions. So it was a challenge. Um, we went slower than we uh, kind of wanted to, but I think that we were expecting to go a little bit slower than we hoped. So our average speed was 4.9 knots, which was, um, as Nick said before, challenging psychologically at times to not be going to, you know, as quickly as we wanted to. And um, yeah, it was, we had all sorts of conditions and, and sometimes it was just the best sailing that we'd ever had. And sometimes it was like the most frustrating sailing that we'd ever had. So ups and downs really. That's a summary, is it? <coughs> Taking a leaf out of your book. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> and prepare yourself. Hold my bed. <laughs> I'm going to make this shorter than yours. Um, what I would say is, yeah, I agree with everything Teresa says. I think that it is something that many, many sailors, if not most sailors, aspire to do. I think that while it is challenging, it is ultimately like, really worthwhile. There are times when you're miserable. There are times when you want it to be over. But when you... Ref I, I stand by the fact that you cannot judge a situation until it becomes the past. So you have time to reflect on things once it's happened. And I think that it's it, it's it's super worthwhile. I I I would suggest that if you get a chance to do it, do it. It is, you know, it's a fantastic, fantastic, life affirming, um, life affirming experience. experience. And yeah, without being overly kind of like airy fairy about this, I think you know it kind of makes you appreciate how small you are in the world when you're kind of like in a small boat in the middle of the ocean. Absolutely. I mean, I think that being in the middle of the ocean is. A magical experience I really do um, yeah I, I think it's uh... there we go yeah so thanks so much for watching uh, this um, yes it's a little dry but you it was <laughs> or fascinating depending on yeah, uh, um, how you we about will this, be back uh, with our regular episodes as always so there'll be a subscribe something up there somewhere feel free to subscribe and our social media is below thanks for watching see you on Friday it's always Thursday put the videos out Oh shit. See you on Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> oh! <laughs> Almost did it. Should we do that again? No. Okay.